I'll just introduce you, or if you want to, I'm going to introduce someone if you want to start with the music. It's up yeah, to you. I was going to play first. Yeah, I was just going to introduce you then, just saying you're going to be a musical item and then you're going to go into your talk. Okay. I'll, let me bring it so I'm not like. <laughs> no, no. Hi, my name is Sophie Holder. I'm executive officer in the EDI department at De Montford University, and I'm very excited to be introducing you and welcoming you to another series, another episode in the anti-racism series, which focus on race and various issues as they display themselves in academia. Now, this is a special edition because it's for Black History Month, which is a time that we set aside in October in the United Kingdom to celebrate the history and the contribution of Black heritage people within the United Kingdom. Now, we have a very special guest who I'm looking to introduce to you, and that is Professor Nate Holder. I'm just going to take a minute to read you out his bio because because there is a lot of information that I don't want to get wrong. So Nate is a musician, author, and music education consultant. He comes from a family of musicians, and he is pursuing his passion as he has done around the world, working with Getz, Emily Sander, Ed Sheeran, um, and he's also consulted for the BBC and has also written nine books. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nine books, including I Wish I Didn't Quit Music Lessons and Where Are All the Black Female Composers. Now, in today's talk, Professor Nate is going to be talking about why we need to decolonize music and what the term decolonize means when we refer to music within the academic field. But we are going to start off with a very special musical performance that he'll be doing in just a couple of minutes. It will then lead on to a talk, and then we'll be joined by Dr. Lisa Palmer, who is the interim director at the Stephen Lawrence Research Center who will be talking a bit about her research that looks at music and then we'll be asking them a few questions. So make sure that you stay tuned. But now I'll hand over to Professor Nate Holder as he gives us a special musical rendition which will lead into his talk. 
normally start off talk by playing, but I, I feel like today is a bit of a special occasion, um, Black History Month as well. And that song I, was a song that I wrote called Unpeople, inspired by a book by a man by the name of Mark Curtis. Um, he wrote this book about, and he, if you ever check out his work, he's written a few books about Britain and the secret histories, the histories that we don't often, we're not often taught about, we're often told about. I read this book a few years ago and I decided to write something based on that because you realize that, you know, him and there's a, a quote from Noam Chomsky, there's a, a, a talk that he was giving and we talked about, you know, definition of unpeople, how there are people who matter and people who don't. And the people who matter are, you know, people and the rest are these unpeople, right? You can kind of, and to, to use his words, you can kind of do whatever you want to do with them. I think we see that played out in the world in different ways, not just in music, we're here to talk about music today, but I think we see it in politics, right? We see it in, in, in current affairs, we see it in the new, we see it everywhere. And so even though my talk today isn't focusing on unpeople necessarily, I think it's, it's a way of kind of segueing into these topics around decolonization, around diversity in some ways, or understanding that there are people whose lives have always mattered Right? but haven't necessarily got the recognition of that. And so I think this is part of what we're talking about today. Not all of it, but part of it. So before I start talking, I'm going to play you a, a poem that I wrote a couple of years ago, specifically about music, but talking about these issues that, for me, was partly frustration um, and partly research. Partly, I think, when we're thinking about positionality and who we are, I think part of what we're made up of is the things that we can't control, right? So that's you know, where we're born and who our family are. And then the other half of it, or even maybe more of it in some cases, is the things that we've chosen to do, the things that we've chosen to read, watch, listen to, learn, etc. And so this poem was kind of a, a part frustration, part reflection, part hope, part many different things um, to really try and I guess put things in into one place so that for many people, and it's been it's been really interesting to hear the response to this. I'm um, seeing some of the issues kind of laid out in a very digestible way, but uncomfortable way. And so I'll play that for you, and then I'll continue. If I were racist, I'd teach children that talking about music means texture, timbre, and tempo. If you can't use these words then you're not a musician. If I were a racist, I'd teach reggae music and Bob Marley, steer it up, but never war. I might even mention marijuana. If I were a racist, I'd insist that all music be taught from notation, removing all the nuances that paper could ever express. If I were a racist, I teach African drumming, because of course, Africa is a country. If I were a racist, I teach that the great composers were Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, and Bach, not Miles Davis, Florence Price, Alice Coltrane, and Jay Dillon. If I were a racist, I'd make sure that gospel, blues, and jazz were always taught as music created by slaves. If I were a racist, I'd call all non-white music world music. After all, it's them and us. If I were a racist, I'd ignore that Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn, and Bach, and the transatlantic slave trip happen at the same time. If I were a racist, I'd make sure that violins and pianos were seen as more important than steel pans, tablets, and didgeridoos. If I were a racist, I'd teach African songs without knowing what they mean or where they really come from. If I were a racist, I'd standardize everything. Either you're in tune or you're out, literally. If I were a racist, 
I have posters of me on the walls and in the books. No black or brown faces, just my own. If I were a racist, I'd make you think that having one brown face would be enough. Diversity, inclusion. If I were a racist, I'd be fine with all white exam boards, all white teaching staff, and study all white musicians. If I were a racist, I'd insist that children learn Western music notation, forgetting that many civilizations flourished without it for centuries. If I were a racist, I'd put up black squares and messages about standing together and then never invest in anti-racism training for my staff. If I were a racist, I wouldn't address outdated policies or really let black and brown people feel safe to speak on their experiences. If I were a racist, I'd know that even though the notes may be black, the spaces would remain white. So, and you can see that poem in some ways tried to really just capture many different things. And to be fair, we could go through each line by line and really dissect that over the course of an hour, but we are time to do that today. Um, so what I'm gonna do is move on to a, a, a quote by um, Dr. Eric Williams, who was the first um, prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago. And he says this, if there is to be a new type of education, then we must be based on different economic, social, and political concepts. And I just want you to keep that in mind as we go through today. Now to read it one more time. If there is to be a new type of education, it must be based on different economic, social, and political concepts. And so in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go too much into colonization, but of course, I don't think we can talk about decolonizing anything without talking about colonization and what it was. And so with a particular focus on music, if I may, so wanted to make sure that when we think about this quote especially, we understand that the roots of all of this, in my opinion, I think in the opinion of others, started from an economic point of view, not necessarily a racism point of view. It wasn't necessarily about going to different places and, and, and looking at people and telling them that you know, they were wrong in what they were doing, but it was about, at first, gathering resources and taking resources back to places around Western Europe, especially you know, England, France, Germany, as we know it to be now, um, Denmark, Portugal, Spain, and other countries. And specifically, we think about music and the implications it had on music. You can see many different um, accounts, whether it's in, in where some of my research has been in the Caribbean, about people talking about Barbados and the music that they heard over there, um, how they describe it as barbaric, how they describe it as idolatrous. And you see the same kind of um, phrases and tropes used to talk about the music as we see even today in different places, right? So we hear about, you know, the, the legacies of people like Carl Linnaeus, right? We're talking about um, people who were you know, the early eugenicists, people who, who felt as though white people were superior and started to create these taxonomies of humanity in a sense, right? Um, and these ideas filtered down not just about the people themselves, but about the music they produced and about the religions that they had, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll touch on that in a second. Um, but essentially, what we start to see is that as colonization grew and grew and grew and grew and grew, it wasn't just about the economics. It started to become about a lot more things that were much more insidious and had ramifications to how we, how we live and we see the world today. And so what I want to do, again, in the interest of time, speeding through some of the different things, um, is to play you a clip um, that came out in 2020 in YouTube by the name of Adam Neely. And in this clip, he, he speaks to Philip Yule, who's a musicologist based in the States. And I um, just have to say, I'm very I'm honored. I'm going to be on a panel with Philip Yule in next month. Um, so I'll share a link so maybe you can all attend. It's going to be online and it's all free. So just let you know. But uh, Philip Yule, for me, is someone who, you know, he's, he's explored these issues and um, he has a lot to say on them. So if you are interested in learning a bit more, then I encourage you to check him out. But I'll play this clip really quickly um, and then carry on. Let me put it this way, what most people think of as music theory actually does a pretty bad job of describing musical practice in most styles of music. 
Instead, this has kind of been used as a means of comparing all music from all people across the globe to the stylistic practice of a select few musicians. These guys versus, say, I don't know, <sighs> these guys. So, can you spot the difference between the tonal composers on the left and the tonal composers on the right? That's right, the ones on the left are American. The ones on the right are German. They clearly wrote the better music, which is why we study them. They clearly have the superior music. They clearly have a superior culture. They are individuals of genius who rise above the degenerate masses and their degenerate music. They are one, the white racial frame of music theory. Hi, my name is Philip Ewell. I am an associate professor of music theory at Hunter College here in New York City. Dr. Ewell gave the keynote speech at the annual Society of Law Music Theory conference. Our white racial frame believes that the music and music theories of white persons represent the best framework for music theory. It's part of everything that we do, white racial framing in music. All of the materials that we use in our music theory classes, for sure, are so deeply indebted to whiteness. In his paper, The White Racial Frame of Music Theory, Dr. Ewell says that music theory can be seen as a racial ideology in which the views and ideas of white persons are held to be more significant than the views and ideas of non-whites. Woo, okay. Racial ideology. That sounds like some critical race theory jargon. And as we've learned recently, that is un-American. So I don't want to talk about that too much on this channel, lest we be accused of un-American activities. So to try and figure out why American music theory is not built around these American composers, we're gonna focus on just the music. And we already kind of have done that. We saw how music theory in popular culture can simply just mean the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians. And there are some musical elements which are unique to that style that are not shared in other styles, which are oddly prioritized. One thing I like to... Well, there's a lot more context behind that clip. For sure. But again, in, in interest of time, trying to get through so many different things. Um, usually I'd love to spend five, six, seven, eight hours actually just kind of deep in deep, deep dive into all of these different things, but um, just trying to give you bits and pieces as we go along. So I wanted to pick up on a couple of things, especially when we talk about great composers. And I alluded to it in, in, in the poem as well. Um, but one of the things I think is very clear here and what he talks about, and again, if you, you know, if you study and you learn more, you start to see, is that this idea of who, who is the great, who are the great composers and what they represent. Um, and I think there's a very, there's a very, there are very clear similarities between people like Carl Linnaeus and, and the like who were writing about, you know, the hierarchies of human, humanity at the time and the, the, the hierarchies of who becomes, who's allowed to be a great composer and who's not, right? For one, they're all men. That's one thing. Another thing, they're all white, and another thing, they all come from a very particular place in the world, uh, from a very specific time in the world. Again, talking about the same era as from when the transatlantic slave trade was at its peak, right? In like the 17th century, 18th centuries. And the thing about these people is that for some, and Philip Buell talks about this in, in, in his papers, is he, the title of one of his blogs is called, you know, Beethoven was an above average composer and let's leave it at that, which you can imagine, you say something like that and you've got a lot of people coming after you because for many of us, we've been told repeatedly that Beethoven is, you know, almost the pinnacle of, of, of music in, you know, that has been and will ever be. There's a, a quote by a, a biologist, I can't remember his name right now, but he essentially said, you know, if we were to send, he was asked, you know, if we were to send out some music into the universe, what would you send them? And he said, well, I was sending the complete works of Bach, but actually that would be boasting, right? Just it goes to show, you know, this idea that actually what we have from these, from these very few German composers actually represents the best that could exist in the whole universe, right? And I think one of the things to say is this, it's not that um, their music isn't great or good, if we want to just leave the word great out of it for a second, um, but it's the fact that these ideas, without being challenged, remain. I think there's some, some people might argue, well, this happened hundreds of years ago, so what's the relevance today? But I think the point is this, if you don't challenge things and if you don't correct things, if you don't seek to understand and to change things, they don't just go away. If anything, they fester and they become deeper embedded in society to a point where we can't even see them anymore. 
And so what Philip Yule says is this, he says that Beethoven occupies the place he does because he has been propped up by whiteness and maleness for 200 years. And we have been told by whiteness and maleness that his greatness has nothing to do with whiteness and maleness in race neutral and gender neutral fashion. And this whole idea about neutrality is something that we'll come back to in a second as well. And Julia Hess writes this, whiteness is present in our repertoire and in our curriculum. It is present in our emphasis of a notation, in notation over orality. It is present in the instruments that are available to students and the comportment we expect of them. Moreover, it is present in who participates in ensembles and who can ultimately become a music teacher. Attending to the ways that whiteness manifests in music education may allow teachers to address it and make moves towards anti-racism. And for those who might be a bit confused about why we talk about whiteness all of a sudden, essentially what we're talking about is a way of thinking about the world and specifically about music that has been created by white people for white people and, and to exclude many other groups of people around the world, including white women, including black people, including Asian people, including people from different, who identify different genders, everyone else apart from this a sense one version of masculinity, this white masculinity that has been pushed into what has been has been almost rammed down our throats for hundreds of years, especially for people who don't come from certain countries and who don't who don't have certain heritages. And again, there's so much more we can go into about you know the ways in which um, these ideas have been pushed on us, even in terms of Christianity and the links between Christianity and whiteness. And um, reading something recently, which essentially talks about how you cannot separate whiteness from Christianity in some sense, in some cases, in some sense, the idea of whiteness was perpetuated by Christianity itself, as opposed to it being something that happened alongside. And so as we move forward, we start to see how this white racial frame of music and music education and music theory has affected how we talk about music today. So whether it be the languages that we use when we talk about music, whether it's you know terms that many of us are familiar with, crescendo, diminuendo, et cetera, et cetera, these are Italian words, right? Because it, at a certain point in history, Italy was the hub of all of this, you know, this European, the high art of European music. The history of music, how we're often taught the history of music goes, you know, the flow of it essentially starting from monks in, in churches singing in, 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 in unison, and then at some point someone deciding to sing in octaves, and then we add fifths and we add fourths, and harmony starts to grow there, but never any mention of what was happening in Mesopotamia, never any mention of what's happening in Syria, never any mention of what's happening in China, for example. Again, we've spoken about the great composers already, who they are and who they're not allowed to be in some cases. 12 turn, this is essentially just the idea of breaking up an octave into 12 equal parts, which we see in many places in Western Europe, but we don't necessarily see in other places around the world where we might have 19 tet systems or 27 tet systems, very different ways of understanding and listening and experiencing music. Entry criteria, this is an interesting one because what we start to see is that if you come from a culture and a way of thinking about music that is normal to you, when you start to enter into, um, into, into school or into university, you start to see that the barriers start to, start to mount up. So if you're not familiar with how to read music, you, it's very difficult to get in. If you're not familiar with certain words and languages, you know, the, the crescendos, the minuans that I spoke about earlier, it becomes very difficult for you to get in. Right? And so as we grow older, in a sense, if you're not a part of that culture from, an early, from, from a young age, and if your parents aren't, aren't, don't have a certain amount of money as well, because that comes into it, it becomes harder and harder to get in. Context is an interesting one, just the context that we use when we're talking about um, great composers and we're talking about music around the world, the context and the things that we decide to leave out and the things that we decide to include something for you to think about. The instruments that, in a sense, are, are seen as more important than others. And access to research, even just the fact that so much research is conducted in English, is a huge barrier for so many people around the world. There's so many ideas and so many theories that have been written in Arabic and written in French and written in, in Hebrew and written in many different languages, and you name it. But because it's not written in English, it's very hard for us to read it, and because it's not really in English, it's very hard for those people to actually contribute to the, to the conversations that are happening. And so with all of these things, I think we have to start asking ourselves these questions about, well, not only why is this the case, but how can we seek to change these things? And a document came out earlier this year by um, the DfE, 
And if, you're, if you've been keeping up with all things music education, you'd know about this. It's been coming for many years, the new National Plan for Music Education. And reading through this document, there's a few things that stood out. One of the things is this. I think this, in a sense, explains part of the reason why we're talking about these things here. Page 34, it says, demonstrate knowledge of Western classical music and music from a range of musical traditions and understand some of the context that brought the music into being. And on the surface, that might sound like a very innocuous statement, but when I read it, I see the term Western classical music and music, and you see this clear separation between the two. And so I read this and think, well, what are you, what are you getting at here? What you're saying is you need to demonstrate knowledge of this particular style of music and then music from places that we don't, we're not going to be very specific about it. We're just saying, we see that there's a clear separation between the two. And this is part of the problem that is so embedded into how we talk about even government documents is so embedded about how we see music being very much a matter of there's music that's created by white Western Europeans and then there's music created by everybody else. This idea of world music, right? Well, technically we're all in the world, but we're not really because we have world music, which is essentially the black and brown people of this world, right? And so this idea of decolonizing, I think is a really powerful and detailed and context specific idea that I think for many reasons has started to become whitewashed over the last few years. It's not a new, it's not a new term, even though I think for many of us, we might have only come across it and the use of the word has, has spiked over the last three or four years. But essentially this word started to come about in the early parts of the 20th century. And the reasons why was because there were many countries around the earth who were colonized by France and were colonized by what we now know to be Germany and colonized by the, Euro by the English, etc. Who wanted to who wanted to break away from their colonial masters in a sense and decolonize and become independent. And the root of all of it, and like I said before, to keep that quote from Eric Williams in your mind before, the root of all of it was economic. It was to be able to take back what was theirs, take back control of their land, take back control of their economies, take back control of their knowledge, of their languages, of their religions, of their social hierarchies, take control because for so many years it wasn't under their control. And I think sometimes what we see now is this conflation between the ideas of decolonization and diversity, which is much easier pure to swallow in a sense. So this, this quote, I think it speaks to some of it, not necessarily all of it, but speaks to some of it. Decolonization typically refers to the withdrawal of political, military, and governmental rule of a colonized land by its invaders. Decolonizing education, however, is understood, is often understood as a process in which we rethink, reframe, and construct a curricula and research that preserve the Europe-centered centered colonial lens. It should not be mistaken for diversification, as diversity can still exist within this Western bias. Decolonization goes further and deeper in challenging the institutional hierarchy and monopoly on knowledge moving out of a Western framework. I think it's really important for us to understand, even in this country, that we face significant barriers when we're thinking about these ideas of decolonization. There's a great book, if you haven't checked it out already, um, by um, Ngege Wationgo, where he talks about um, decolonizing the mind, the book's called. And he asked so many different questions in that we really, when you start to ask yourself those questions, you really makes you think about the barriers and the, and the, the, the ways in which it's gonna, it might potentially be very, very difficult for us to do and to imagine exactly how this, that, how this decolonization can look in this country, given the fact that even if we are black or we are Asian, we speak English. That's a barrier that's in and of itself. The fact that many of us might subscribe to be, to be Christian is a barrier in itself. The fact that many of us might have already learned what it is to be a musician in, in Western Europe is a barrier in and of itself. And there's a couple of things that, that, that Sophia Kiel doesn't go into in this, which I'll touch on a bit later. And I'm wary of time as well, but yeah, there's so much we can dive into on this. Let's skip this real quick. So to bring you to this, when we talk about diversity, it's interesting to think of it in this way. And I think when I read this, it really resonated with me. 
Western education is shaped to take us on the journey of cultural addition. Add to the great European thinkers who are not white or male, but who approximate them. Add, the, add these non-white others as embroidery to frame a picture or spices to season a dish. And for me, what this speaks to is not decolonization, it's, it's this idea of diversity. For many of us in music education, particularly in the classical world, the name Florence Price has appeared over and over and over and over and over in the last few years. Florence Price being a woman, a black woman who created music and was one of the first women to have their a symphony premiered by a major European orchestra in the US, by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in the 1950s. And for her, for example, including her in the canon, not necessarily to say that this, you know, she has been officially inducted in, in she has been officially inducted into the canon, but to place her alongside people like Mozart and Haydn and Bach, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, is in a sense what we've done with her. It's add her because we can see that her music is good enough, right? So she can join the party over here. But for others, it might take a, lot, a, bit, a bit of time and their music actually might not stack up. I've seen personally comments of music teachers, which is probably the, one of the most distressing things, talking about how, and I remember one specifically, said one one man who's writing on Facebook said, you know, I've listened to the music of a lot of female composers and there's nothing special. Right. But these are the attitudes. And these are the real attitudes of people, right? And just to kind of like I've got these in slightly different orders than wanted what I wanted to have, but just speaking really quickly about black women, there's this I I'm, was writing a, a, a book chapter recently um, looking at um, music education and, and black feminism. And one of the things I wrote in there is that what you cannot do is treat black women the same as you treat Beethoven and Haydn and Bach. You can't do it. Because for one, the context of these women and the histories and the struggles that they had to go through in many different ways, if you just add them like the quote talks about adding them like spices to a dish, you're not really understanding who they are. And for many of them, you take Florence Price, for example, one of her most popular tunes, Juba Dance, for example. You can't talk about that tune without understanding what Juba Dance is. And you can't understand that without understanding the history of Black Americans in the South. Right? Juba Dance being this, or called Patton Hambone, this idea of we weren't allowed to have instruments, so we started to use our bodies to make sounds. And so she writes a piece about that. So if you just take that piece and you look at the, the, the harmonies and the melodies, all you're doing is adding her to the list and you're not really investigating who she was and why she was, what she was writing about. And this can go for people like Erin and Wallen, it can go for people like Little Sims, it can go for so many other black women. It's not just about adding black women or anyone to the canon. It's about actually looking at our context and what makes, what are the things that have allowed us to do what we've done? And what are the things that we don't want to talk about in our music? And what are the things, even on the flip side, that Beethoven doesn't write about in his music? And why? Why isn't Bach talking about this? Why isn't Mozart talking about this? Why isn't Handel, who invested in the slave trade, talking about it in his music? And so just to go back to this really quick. Again, this is from the New National Plan of Music Education. I'm jumping around a little bit. But one of the things that I find was really, really, and I hesitate to use the word fascinating, and it's really, really, I think, illuminating was the wording of some of this. And we'll come back to this in a second. But I just want you to keep in mind the idea of soft power, which is what it says here. But I'll come back to it. But essentially here, what I, what, how I imagine all of this and how I see this all is that inclusion is something that we can all get behind. It's very... It's very self-explanatory. We want everyone to be included in what we do. That's not, that's not an issue at all. When we talk about diversity, I think it becomes a bit trickier because diversity means that we have to, we have to learn <laughs> something, right? Not to say that there's nothing to learn with inclusion, but with diversity, I think there's a specific ways in which we have to start to think about the world. And we have to start, in some ways, we have to start excluding things that we've already we've been used to using over and over and over. To diversify a repertoire means that you can't just play all of, you can't play 10 bar tunes, you have to play maybe only five, right? You know, which for some people is a problem. 
right? For some people, it's a huge problem. And so this idea of diversity is a bit of a, it can be a very, very big barrier, even though for many of us, we don't believe so. So decolonization, if we're actually thinking about knowledge and production of knowledge and where this knowledge comes from, is an even bigger barrier, which often becomes politicized, as we've seen over the last few years, which again, is a massive, massive problem because a lot of people see that and they believe that it means black people are just trying to take over and get rid of white people, but that's not the case. That's not what we've ever been saying. To go back to Eric Williams, and I'm starting to wrap up here to talk about what we might look at as decolonization in the future. And Eric Williams here in 1946 is talking about Trinidad, understanding that the ways in which Trinidadians were educated back then was very much based on Western European ideas, what's specifically British ideas about what education should be. So there's, um, he, he writes about children being taught about going to granddad's house in the snow and being taught that this is a, these are songs that they need to learn, whereas there's no snow in Trinidad and Tobago. So why are they being taught to learn this? And so this idea, I think, partly of decolonization is not just about, you know, having more voices into the, into the, um, into different conversations, but it's also about understanding pedagogy of education, right? And he says this, the education system of these countries, which he's talking about colonial or post-colonial countries, violates the fundamental principle that education should proceed from the known to the unknown, from the village to the great wild world, from the indigenous plants, animals, and insects, to the flora and fauna of strange countries, from the economy of the village and the household to the economies of the world. Essentially, in a similar way to what Paulo Freire talks about in his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, about how it is not just about this banking system of, 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 of education, which he talks about, that system of assuming that you have nothing in your mind and that we as educators have to give you and give you and give you and tell you what you need to know. It's all about in different ways, understanding that you, even as a four-year-old come into a classroom with a lot of knowledge, you might not be able to articulate it, but there's things that you know and things that you understand to be different. And we can see there's so many studies that show that children are starting to understand their racial identities as early as four or five years old, right? So in that sense, if we are to decolonize even how we teach, potentially we have to start looking at it a different way. It can't just be about that same rote way of learning. Potentially it has to be about understanding who is in the classroom, what their individual needs are, and how they can be best met. And even to the extent of, I'm skipping ahead, I'm gonna skip, I'll skip this and come back to this, but the way I like to look at these ideas around decolonization, diversity is, is with this pizza analogy. Bear with me. So the idea is this. What we normally have, or what we kind of feel like to be common is this idea of this, you know, cheese, tomato base, and dough, right? That's just what we've been used to. That's the pizza, right? And then what starts to happen, going back to that other quote about um, adding people to a dish, is that we think that we're being diverse. And for many people, we think, well, we're decolonizing because we can add Florence Price here, we can add Miles Davis here, the equivalent of adding some sweet corn, adding some, you know, whatever, ham or whatever different toppings you want on your pizza. But fundamentally, what we still have is that base of dough, and we still have that tomato base, and we still have the cheese. That doesn't change, but we can add everything else on top. And so I think what challenge of decolonization is, is to think about what would it look like, what would it feel like, what would it sound like if instead of having that particular way of laying out a pizza, we would replace that with roti, for example. What would happen? What would it look like if we had injera instead of that? What would it look like if we had chapati instead? What would it look like if the idea of what a flatbread is was totally changed? And what would happen if we could, if we could shift from this to that, to this to that, depending on what we're trying to understand at that particular point in time? I think these are some of the challenges. But moving quickly on, one thing that I do want to say before I stop talking is going back to the whole economic side of things, which is a, thing, a side of things that we don't often talk about and a side of things that I think is very, very challenging for us to understand and very, very challenging for us to come to terms with. And the idea is just this. You can diversify a classroom, a musical classroom, or an English lit classroom by having lots of black 
Asian, you name it, it doesn't matter. You can, you can diversify it by having many different styles of music and many different instruments, right? But, and this is the but, if we have a whole suite of tablets coming into a classroom, yes, we've diversified our instruments and teaching children about tablets, but if those tablets were made in the USA, what is happening there? Right? If you have a set of gem maids, but these gem maids are made in China, what's happening there? If you have a whole new library full of books written by black women and written by, by queer folk, but they're all published by white publishers, what's happening there? At the core, what needs to be addressed is a system of white supremacy which allows for minstrel songs and other racist songs to make it into the songbooks that teacher training programs and we teachers pay thousands of dollars to learn from, to be normalized and accepted as the norm. Underlying all of this in many different ways, even though we've seen a, a swathe of new um, authors and books celebrating blackness, essentially what we still have, the system behind it is still white. The publishers are still white. The people who are manufacturing these and, and importing these instruments often are still white. And so if we are to think about education again, to go back to the Eric Williams quote, it has to be on different terms. The pedagogy of the oppressed cannot be developed or practiced by the oppressors. It would be a contradiction in terms if the oppressors not only defended, but actually implemented the liberating education. In some ways, I think we have to understand that to do this work, it has to be on our own shoulders. And unfortunately, you know, I think for some of us, the, the rhetoric has been, well, we have to show, we shouldn't have to shoulder the burden. But I think unless we do in some ways, we're not gonna achieve what we really want to achieve because ultimately it's gonna be people, we're gonna be still asking in, in, in the words of Oliver Twist, please sir, can I have some more? So like I said, there's a lot more, there's a lot of other quotes that I could have gone back to, whatever, but. I think I'll end there, just with this quote again. If there's to be a new type of education, it must be based on different economic, social, and political concepts. If it's not, then I'd just throw the question out to you, then what are we really doing? Thank you. Thank you so much. That was just, for me, it was mind blowing. Um, this is somebody who loves music, who comes from a Christian background where music was also very important um, and where even within black led, black dominated churches, there was also a preference for certain types of music when you learnt it. It was you learn on the piano and you learn a certain type of classical music because that was like the top music. And then there was all the others underneath and just thinking about how does that work? And I want to touch on that a little bit because we've got a little bit of time left. Um, but I first want to welcome Dr. Lisa Palmer to the panel. Please come up. Please give her a round of applause. So Dr. Palmer, as I said, is the interim director at the Stephen Norris Research Center, and she is the former course director for the Black Studies undergraduate program for senior lecturer and senior lecturer in sociology at Birmingham University. Her work has focused on black feminism, black cultural politics, and the intersection of race, racism, gender, and sexuality. And her work that she's currently working on and co-authoring is a book on UK lovers rock reggae scene. So I wish we had more time to go into it fully. So what I'm gonna do is talk about something that can bring in a lot of your research. When you were talking, um, Nathan, about Black, no, music, blackness, and womanhood. Why is that such an important intersection for us to talk about when decolonizing music? Both of you, because it is the focus of your work. Why is that such an important thing? Why can't we just say women in general? Why do there need to be a focus on? <laughs> Please go. <laughs> well, firstly, thank you for your really powerful presentation. And I think it does resonate with some of the questions that I'm asking with um, my study of, and work on lovers' rap music and looking at women within that, that genre. Um, I think the reason why it's important, because when we're talking about questions of decolonization, um, there are always questions around gender and sexuality embedded in, in that politics. And it's like, well, if we're gonna talk about decolonizing along the lines of race, then we also have to really take seriously 
the ways in which that impacts um, women and the way in which we think about um, what the politics of decolonization is trying to achieve. So I think if it is about a kind of politics of freedom, politics of liberation, as you said, like asking the question, well, what are we doing? The question is, well, where are we, where are we going with the politics and what do we want to see at the end? There's, there isn't a kind of end, there isn't mm. a kind of um, end point, there isn't a kind of paradise, but there's a kind of vision for where we want to go. And that vision has to include a kind of decolonizing sexism, decolonizing um, racism, decolonizing kind of homophobia and all of the kind of structures of power that are not about liberation. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're working in opposite ways to sustain exactly what you're saying, Nate, about the kind of infrastructure that exists in the first place. So that's why I think it's important to focus on black women, not on black women exclusively. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's, it, I'm using Lover's Rock to ask questions around the role of women within reggae music okay. and the wider questions around um, black, it's coming from the, the other end of the, the, um, the argument in a sense that looking at um, the, the white power structure in which you're looking at, at I'm asking the question, but underneath that power structure, there are power structures that we create ourselves mm -hmm. and in resistance to, to that to that power. Mm -hmm. And then what are the politics of resistance underneath that and how, you know, how are we framing those politics of resistance? So that's okay. part of the work that I do. Okay. So let me move on to another question for both of you then. You're looking at music from a very academic perspective both of you, from a history perspective in terms of Lover's Rock and just the genre of music within its wider form. What would you say to people who would say, well, that's good for academia, but what does that really have to do with me? I just like to listen to music. Isn't music neutral? Why do we need to be thinking about it? Why can't people just listen to the music that they're interested in? Why is this so important, not just in academia, but for everybody to just be asking these questions in terms of music? Good question. Um, I think, I think, of course, if you want to listen to music, you listen to what you want to listen to. Like that's, you know, of course, that's that's it's you know your own personal taste. It's not it's not that. I think it's it is for me. It it kind of boils down to education because I think when you start to unpick things, you realize that nothing's neutral, um, and even the very appearance of neutrality, I think, is deliberate in some cases. So I think if the average person, you know, I'm the average person as well. Like if we are if we are not asking these questions about neutrality, we're not asking the questions. Well, how comes you know the, the top selling artists of you know the last hundred years have you know ninety percent of them have been have been white and ninety percent of them have been have been making music in English? You know, I think what we're doing is robbing ourselves of experiences that might fulfill us. Right? I think that's part of it anyway. It's the fact that if we've if we haven't been used to listening to music in in, in you know, different styles and different, different, um, you know, different like, certain scales and, and, and certain ways of, of counting. We used to we count in four a lot, but if we're not used to hearing and understanding how to count in seven or nine or eleven, there's so much music that we just reject and the people along with it, mm -hmm. right? So I think in part it is saying to people, well, hey, if you there's so much more out there to experience and so much more out there to, to understand, and by doing that, I think part of it is that you. You understand pe people's music and you understand them. Mm -hmm. I think that's such an important point because um, in terms of the work that we do in decolonizing DMU, which is about decolonizing the curriculum, um, the research that I have to do has touched on this idea, you know we all gain when we decolonize. We're all learning something different. We're all experiencing something new. And I think you spoke about it in your presentation. There's this idea of we're taken away, we're robbing, um, but the 10 bar are now gonna become five and people are gonna get upset. We're like, don't you understand that there's more for all of us to experience? I think sometimes that is left out of the conversation with decolonization or purposefully, mm. to be honest. Um, but I, I do think though, I, I do think there is an element of having to let go. Mm -hmm. there, 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 there has to be. Um, it, and it's, it's, it's really it's really interesting. I was at a, a conference a couple weeks ago, and they were talking about sustainability and music, and and and, and you realise that for much of Earth's history, our solution has been to grow. Mm. You know, so it's like we need more hospitals, we need more schools. We, need, we grow, we build, we grow, and we build, and then now we're at a point in Earth's history where it's like, 
actually we probably shouldn't be doing that anymore. So what does that mean? It means that some people have to give or it has to be, it has to be taken, but you know, we, we can't keep growing the cake. It has to be split into different ways now because it's just the planet can't handle it. Mm -hmm. We can't grow anymore. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, yes, some people have to give up what they, what they've had, but I mean, that's the struggle because who wants to give up? Who wants to give anything up? <laughs> you know? I think it's a, it, a question of power, isn't it, as well? So, because like, in giving up something, you're relinquishing power, and and that's the thing that is reluctant to be relinquished, in a sense that um, who wants to, um, if you've built a system based on competi competition, um, control, accumulation, and and that produces a kind of inequality, both economically and as what you're talking about kind of the, in, in its knowledge, in its production of knowledge, it produces an inequality in, in, in that space, then there's always gonna be a resistance to that change, mm -hmm. even though the society is screaming out that the change is needed. Mm -hmm. So people know that, that, we innately know the change is needed. Um, if we look at the economic systems that are trying to sus be sustained at the minute, they're not sustainable. We're living through chaos in this country at the moment. Let's just put it like that. And I think that it's chaos for a reason because mm -hmm. it's it's not functioning in a way that is is actually working anymore. Mm -hmm. There is the, there needs to be a, a not acknowledgement of the changes that are needed to move to a different point. But the vision to do that and the reluctance to do it to relinquish that power, um, as we can see, is just it's, it, it, we, we're not moving. Forward quickly, you know. And I think something that I'll, I'll just talk about quickly and move on to the next question, which you've both just touched on now, this idea of behind the music, there's power and there's money. And I think when we can be people who casually, well, not even casually, people who aren't looking at music from an academic perspective, and you're just listening to it for enjoyment, as I think music should be listened to, you're not thinking that there is a lot of money that has been made throughout time, throughout space, within academia and various circles that is coming, that is um, necessitating the reasons why people don't want to let go of it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think that's just a very important point, because I don't think a lot of people think about money and money and music yeah. there's usually a sense of enjoyment mm -hmm. it's like well actually someone is profiting from this if they weren't there wouldn't be such a desire to hold on to it exactly okay so it's it's just it's this mm -hmm. quote from the new national plan is that it's you know in talking about education they start talking about well actually the music industry contributes 5.8 billion to the uk economy blah, blah, blah. and then they go on to talk about it it represents it's, it's a large part of it's global, that the uk's global soft power and mm -hmm. then you start to see that and say, well, actually, you're, what you're, what essentially it boils down to, for me, reading that is that you have the music, you have the education, but actually, it's a, it's not, it's, it's a specific type of education in order to further UK's interests abroad, as well as educating young people to think in a certain way so that they end up contributing to that same thing. So, in that way, it's you can't, you can't, it, the education system isn't by itself. It mm. is connected to industry, which is connected to money which is connected to you know in, the, in their words their soft power so mm -hmm. it's it's all kind of a, a pipeline so when you're saying to diversify something that's essentially saying well actually mm -hmm. we're trying to push this message out into the world mm -hmm. and when you're diversifying this and you're changing this and you're adding these people that's not the message we're trying to put out there mm -hmm. because it's affecting our money it might affect our money and it's going to affect how people see us in the world right so yeah that's that's interesting, and this is a just as a sub point, which I found very funny. And um, someone was talking about so many times we prioritize certain careers. They went, if you want to have a career, they would become a music lawyer because they're like, we don't <laughs> think about we're thinking yeah. about bankers or engineers or even the people in front of music like Beyonce or Ed Sheeran. But they're like, there's a lot of money that's being made in the back. I think they said Kim Kardashian's um, father was a music lawyer. They went, yeah. they went, the, the industry is creating a lot of money, and we don't think about it, and we need to start thinking about it in terms of who is benefiting from it when we're yeah. talking about changing it. Well, just to add to that sure. quickly, um, I mean, the, even with the work on Lover's Rock, you'll talk, you can see the women within the genre, and it happened to many of the men as well. But um, again, this kind of hierarchy of power works in a particular way, follows economics. They, the women were talking about the fact that they didn't get paid for their labor, mm. that they, did, they were never really um, compensated for the work that they did and that actually, even though their voices were at the forefront of the job work. Exactly. And also because the producers 
were the people who controlled the um, the kind of industry. A lot of them were uh, male producers, and so they themselves were in this higher structure of power gap where they were locked out of the music industry and created these alternative economies. So these alternative economies generated cash, but again, within that alternative economy, the cash didn't still didn't find mm. some of the women in in that in those spaces. So all of it is. Again, like you said, there's that kind of interconnectedness of, of, of these questions. Yeah. So we're going to have to wrap up because I know our time is short and I know we've got people on the live stream. So the last question, well, I had a lot of questions because I was typing furiously as you were talking. <laughs> but I guess the last question to kind of end this off is, what can we do as everyday people to kind of help in this path to decolonizing music? If we're not teaching in the classrooms, how do we, from where we are, try and make those differences to kind of like, actually, let's kind of think about other forms of music within our within our daily lives. How do we do that? You've got about 20 seconds each. <laughs> I, I think a, sim a simple way, you know, if, if you're seeing, if you're seeing, if you're seeing, you know, retweeting, sharing on Instagram, sharing on, that's, that's like a basic thing that doesn't cost, you know, apart from a bit of time, it doesn't cost anything, right? I think that's definitely one way. And another way is, is is to just is to start to learn. I think realistically, it's you know it's there's so many different people who are kind of digesting, who are who are putting this stuff into really easy easy ways because um, you can read some books and they're you know they're they're huge and they're you know they're really really verbose. But there are people out there who are talking about who are trying to kind of bring these ideas to the average person who doesn't have you know you know hours to sit and read. Right. So I think yeah, you're sharing ideas. And also learning for yourself, I think that's definitely one way to just start. Okay, great. Lisa? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it's about sharing ideas, having conversations. It's not about de not denying anybody enjoyment of music, mm -hmm. but I think it does go back to. I, I always think about when Bell Hooks was kind of ran off Twitter because she she called Beyonce a terrorist, <laughs> and, and the reason and the reason why I'm reminded of that is because. It, she wasn't. It's not necessarily about Beyonce being a, an evil person. It's about the, the. She was asking questions about the structure that yeah. sits behind a system that produces Beyonce, and I think that's the, those are the key kind of questions that we, we, you know, we can enjoy Beyonce's music. We can enjoy, we enjoy a lot of the big name artists, but it's about being inquisitive and curious and asking more questions about the, the whole function of the system that's, that produces these sort of ideas about what music is valuable and who's valuable and, you know, how the economy of music works itself. Okay. Great. I want to say thank you so much to Dr. Lisa Palmer and also to Professor Nate Holder. I could honestly talk about this with you guys for another hour, <laughs> but we don't have the time. Thank you for joining in for this anti-racism lecture. There'll be more events coming on. We also have a few key mark events happening for the end of Black History Month, especially specifically a film event that'll be happening in November. So make sure you check out our site to see what events are still coming. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.